Anonymity by Sarah Stamford In the middle of one Saturday morning, a filthy, dishevelled teenage girl arrives in the small market town of Barden. The first CCTV camera catches her walking quickly onto the main street from the country lane beyond. She looks back anxiously, brushing her unusually long hair out of her face as it catches in the wind. She reaches a bus stop and is frowning at the timetables when a bus arrives. With an expression of overwhelming relief, she gets on. The second CCTV camera sits above the bus driver. Where to, love? Oh, um, as far away as you go. She seems agitated and glances behind her again. That'll be Castleton, love. Four pound thirty. What? That'll be four pounds thirty for your ticket. Panic leaps into her voice. But I haven't any money. What? I'm sorry, but I don't have... Please, please, can you take me to Castleton? Not without a ticket, love. And you can't have a ticket without paying for it. It's in a free ride, you know. Please, I really need to get on. Tears spring into her eyes, and from the red circles surrounding them, it isn't for the first time today. Sorry, love, no can do. Off you get now. Best ask for a bit more pocket money next time. The driver laughs, and reluctantly, the girl gets off the bus. It drives away, and she watches it leave, desperation clouding her features. She seems cold, and buttons up an old-fashioned man's tweed jacket over the thin blouse and long skirt she is wearing. Glancing behind her once more, she begins to walk again quickly, towards the town centre. The third camera watches her navigate Barden's main square. It's market day, and there are dozens of people coming and going, setting up their stalls, browsing. Children run together, shouting in excitement. There's lots of traffic, too. Cars, vans, tractors passing by. The girl weaves through it all, checking over her shoulder several more times, and picks up her pace. She heads past the market, out of the town centre, and onto Barden High Bridge. Here, she disappears. The next time she is seen, it is a week later, and she is half a mile down river, wedged between a log and the river bank, below the water's surface. She's dead. Dead! At the last word, Samuel slopped half his tea down his front and hastily began dabbing at it with his tie. Sandra didn't offer her brother assistance. It was a year ago now. Pluto found her while we were walking. She still saw the girl's face in her dreams. God, Sandra, how awful! She saw her now, white, swollen eyes staring. I was terrified. I was certain it was one of my pupils i just started at Bardale Academy. But I didn't know her. It sounds awful, but the relief that swept through me, kneeling beside a dead girl. Suicide, I suppose. That's what the police thought. The river's rather deep beyond the high bridge. Vicious currents. And she had drowned. So I'm right? No. Ah, oh, Samuel frowned. Must have been an accident, then. She slipped and fell in. No. Sandra met his eyes calmly. No? It crossed my mind, of course. But the bridge has solid stone, waist-high walls. You can't just slip off. Sandra paused. Her upper arms were covered in bruises. But then, God, Sandra, you don't mean someone did it on purpose. That she was... Murdered? Yes. Sandra took a certain savage pleasure from the shock on her brother's face. She did not look forward to their biannual catch-ups, which were made mostly to keep their ailing mother happy. She had intended to stick to the usual saccharine discussions of work, children and upcoming holidays. But somehow, the story had just come out. Samuel's tie was proving ineffectual, and so he let it go staring ruefully down at the salmon silk as he spoke. 
Jesus, Sandra. What happened? I was wondering if you could work it out. What? Samuel's head shot up. Oh, no, not again. She was fourteen, Samuel. Sandra looked at her brother expectantly. He sighed and rubbed at his face. After a few moments, however, he seemed to shake off his dismay and gave her a patient smile. All right, then. Can't be that hard. Who was she? No one knew. What? She wasn't from Baden. It's a tiny town. Someone would have known her. She had no ID, and she wasn't reported missing. The police took fingerprints, DNA, sent her photograph to the local papers. They kept her body for ages, hoping someone would come forward. No one ever did. How strange. More than strange. A flash of anger entered Sandra's voice. Fourteen, and no one was looking for her. Awakened by her tone, Pluto wandered sleepily into the room and nuzzled Sandra's hand. A regular runaway, then. Samuel looked rather disapproving. Parents are fed up. Got herself in trouble, but she's cried wolf a bit too often. Police said the same. Said people stop reporting if it happens often enough, and that if she was a regular truant, her school would still be following up via the proper procedures. There you are, then. Sandra nodded. That was true enough, for a while. But we waited months. Any school would have raised the alarm by then. None did. I tried reaching out, circulating her description. No one recognised it. Samuel was frowning. I suppose she could have been home-educated. But how did she get to Baden? Obviously not by bus. At that point, we didn't know. Someone could have brought her. But why? Or she could have walked, I suppose. But where from? There aren't any other villages within walking distance. And presumably they checked the surrounding farms. Sandra nodded again. There was a long pause. Samuel swirled his remaining tea around, apparently thinking. Finally, Sandra spoke. What about her appearance? What? Oh, I'm afraid girls' fashions are rather beyond me. I don't think dirt has ever been fashionable. No, but if she was a runaway, maybe sleeping rough, that would explain it. The jacket she was wearing was reported stolen the day after she arrived, gone from a porch at a house right on the edge of town. Ah, oh, there you are, then. A runaway and a thief. You think she deliberately chose to steal a man's jacket? You don't need to be a fashion expert to see there's something wrong there. And her hair... Oh, all girls just peculiarly these days. My Beth does anyway. And the hair is ridiculous. Brush in one hand, phone in the other. That's how girls are. I hardly see it as suspicious. No. But that's another point. What? Samuel looked confused. No phone. Who knows a teenager without a phone? Wait. Samuel was looking worried again. How do you know all this? The police surely didn't let you look through her things. Well, I got Lucy involved. There are some perks to your best friend being the PCC. I think she feels sorry for me. After... Sandra swallowed, then shrugged. I think she thought that if I could just get answers... I'd let it go, but... Sandra shrugged again. There's this pervasive prejudice about teenagers, that they're difficult, disobedient troublemakers. But most of them aren't, and they're all still just children, however adult they want to appear. I had to do something. There was a rather uncomfortable pause. Sandra was watching the carpet, not meeting Samuel's stare. She couldn't remember the last time she had said anything so honest to him. Samuel laid his now cold cup of tea on the floor beside his chair and frowned, seeming interested, despite himself. 
Wasn't Lucy investigating? The police had given up. Well, she was still on their missing persons list, and they were hoping for new information, of course. But without an identity, what could they do? I've got it, said Samuel suddenly, sitting up straight and looking very pleased with himself. She was an illegal immigrant. That explains everything. No money, no family, no school, strange clothes. Sandra bit back an unpleasant retort. They had never agreed on that topic. Am I right? No. Ah. Samuel visibly deflated and sat back in his chair, sighing. So, no one in town spoke to her? Only the bus driver. And she got off the bus, then walked towards the bridge? It's in that direction. But you didn't think she was deliberately heading for it? Samuel narrowed his eyes. You thought she was trying to get away from someone? Sandra didn't reply. Samuel got up from his chair and began pacing around the living room, apparently thinking aloud. It was market day, so it would have been nigh on impossible to tell who was after her because there were so many people. But it was broad daylight. He stopped suddenly. CCTV didn't record the bridge? No. The cameras are either side. She walks onto the bridge and never walks off it. And no one followed her onto it? Over two hundred people did, over the course of the day. Crowds, day visitors. Police couldn't identify everyone. But no one saw anything. Impossible. Sandra shook her head. Like you said, the place was full of people. Everyone was busy. And don't forget, it was a week until we knew there was anything to have seen. Another market day had come and gone. People had forgotten things. Dismissed them. Samuel picked up his cold tea, took a gulp, and made a face. For a moment, the room felt silent. Then he looked up. So where do we go from here? He put the cup down and began pacing anew. An odd-looking girl comes to Baden. We don't know how or why, but she wants to get away from someone. Nothing on her. No one knows who she is. She tries to leave by bus, but can't. So she keeps walking, is caught, and, what, thrown off the bridge? As well as the what, there's also the why, said Sandra quietly. All I could think was, who on earth wants to kill a fourteen-year-old girl? Well, it could be anyone. A jealous boyfriend, a mugging gone wrong, a... Samuel seemed to run suddenly out of ideas. Not that many people, then. Samuel turned suddenly to stare at his sister. You do know, don't you? Sandra grimaced. One more clue. Lucy told me about the autopsy. On its own, this might not mean much, but put together, her last meal had been goat. Goat? Hmm. But where? Of course, you can buy goat meat, but it's not common. Nowhere in Baden sells it. I checked. Isn't it rather pricey as well? I believe so. So she stole that, too. But which teenager would steal goat, of all things? That's no help at all. Silence fell again, as Samuel thought. Worked it out? Sandra asked. No, he said eventually. It's a muddle. How on earth did you solve it? Sandra sighed. It was the why. There'd been a recent case in the U.S., only a small news item, also a teenage girl. I tend to remember that sort of thing, now. Life of a teacher. Anyway, she'd been fighting in court 
to claim her identity because her parents had never recorded her existence. She had no documentation, no birth certificate, medical records, school enrollment, nothing. Even though she was standing right there in court, she couldn't prove she existed. I don't see... Oh, come on, Sam. Imagine how much trouble the parents of such a child would be in, in this country. No one knew this girl. She appeared out of nowhere. No money, no school, the hair and clothes, the goat. She seemed to live outside society, to not exist in just the same way. And I thought, well, if you'd created that situation, you'd try very hard to maintain it. It took a while to convince Lucy, but eventually the police found them. Who? Her family, of course. Parents had gone off the grid twenty years before. And I don't just mean they used solar power and grew their own courgettes. They'd vanished, packed everything up and driven as far away from civilization as they could get, found a wood, built a house, had kids. No other relatives. No friends that we could tell. No one knew they were there. Every so often one of them would come to Baden Market with a few eggs, potatoes and things to sell, using the cash to buy stuff they couldn't make themselves. Never spoke to anyone. And the kids never left the place. But why do that? Samuel looked horrified. Sandra pressed her hands to her eyes. They said the world wouldn't leave them alone. They'd wanted privacy, anonymity, peace. To live just how they wanted. The rest of the world, our modern world, wouldn't let them. Samuel knelt by her chair and passed her a packet of tissues. Sandra dabbed at her eyes. I saw the report afterwards. Six children who didn't know anything about the rest of the world could barely read and write. Happy enough, but farm labourers, essentially. No electricity or heating. God knows how they managed in winter. The girl's name was Anna. She'd overheard something, I think. Realised her life wasn't normal. So she'd run away walked all the way to Baden, about fifteen miles and all. Her elder brother confessed. He'd gained some understanding himself of what his parents had done, and knew that if she'd told the authorities, they might all have been taken into care. He'd gone after her, but when she refused to go back, he got angry. Pure opportunity in the end. Waited for no one to be looking and forced her off the bridge. She couldn't swim. Her tears flowing freely now, Sandra reached out for the photo frame which always stood on the table by her chair and pressed it to her heart. Roused by her distress, Pluto got stiffly to his feet again and wandered over, pushing his warm head under her arm. Samuel shut his eyes and pulled his sister into a long hug. It was the first time they'd touched in years. <laughs>